Good morning. Good morning, Father. Thank you for being here this morning as we continue our mission. We most especially want to give God thanks and praise for the ways in which he blesses us every single day. Most especially, we give thanks to God for Deacon Daryl. And we ask that he continue to send upon him the Spirit. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, in all things we come before you with gratitude in our hearts for the many ways in which you operate in our world, most especially to remind us that we are your children, that we are beloved by you. As we continue with this mission, may Deacon Darrell be given the gift of the Spirit to speak the words that need to be spoken to our hearts so that we may hear your voice, Father. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. So let's remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring about a restoration of what the church really is supposed to be. We're trying to renew families and renew parishes to a place where there are communities of communities, where there are families, and we realize that our true identity is in Christ. We are priests, prophets, kings, fulfilling Jesus' ministry, we are ambassadors for Christ to the culture, and we're new beings, recreated, regenerated because of our baptism, filled with every spiritual blessing in the heavens to complete his ministry here on earth. It's not our ministry, it's his ministry. But we have been empowered because of the sacraments of initiation to be bold witnesses to the gospel and the real presence of Christ when we walk out these doors because of what Jesus does for us through the Eucharist. Marriage is the first sacrament created by God prior to the fall. And all the other sacraments are given to us to restore the concept of marriage, the way God originally designed marriage to be, and marriage as a family. Families, hopefully, are great-grandparents grandparents, parents, children, an extended family relationship that is surrounding and helping to form the next generation always to take its place to bring about in the culture God's plan for salvation. That's who we really are. That's our true identity. But we have to pray that identity into existence. Because, you know, when I greet people at my parish, they're walking in in the morning. I always, go, I always show up for Mass 30 minutes early. So I'm there 30 minutes before Mass starts. I'm fully vested. I'm standing out in the front. And as people come in, I say, Hey, saints, or... Hello, Holy One. Hi, Blessed One. Hi, Mighty One. Because I'm speaking prophetically into them who they really are. Now, it really freaks people out when I'm brand new in the parish. <laughs> they don't know how to take me. Okay? Because I'm speaking into them the truth. And we're full of half-truths. We're full of... You're a your behavior and your response is God loves. 
Oh, got it? Understand that kind of huge response, dating God, Lord, with all my heart. And I recognize, God, you love me with all your heart. Don't even look at those. I've changed it all. But all the stuff that's on those pages is good. But I'm going to give the new version to Vic Nikki, and she'll email it to you. Okay? The point is, is that in a relationship, a husband, no, a man and a woman want to get to know each other. So they start to date. And if you're really honest, you reveal your true self to the person you're going to date. And it's really scary and it's really risky because you don't know if that person is eventually going to be your spouse. So you reveal yourself in stages. Okay, you tell them a little bit and you see if they like that part. And then you tell them a little bit more, and then you see that part, and then there comes a place where you know, hey, you know what, this, this person could be the one. This person really could be the one. So I'm going to share with them all of my faults. And I'm going to see if they still love me after I start sharing my faults with them. And if when you meet the person who God has set in advance for you, that person will love you regardless of your faults and they will commit to you to help you become a better person, to get rid of your character flaws as you help them get rid of their character flaws. And then you can build a life together that will last your lifetime here on earth. That's what God is doing for us. Scripture is God revealing himself to you. He wants you to really get to know him, who he really is. In fact, he came to be part of us. The incarnation is God becoming man, God becoming human, to become like us in every way except sin, and then to love us so much, he not only wants to eliminate your sin, he becomes your sin. He wants you, through prayer, to reveal yourself to him, to be honest with him, to tell him, these are all the things that I'm struggling with. I hate this person who's my neighbor because they've got this dog that barks all the time and I can't get to sleep. I don't hate the dog. The dog's just being a dog. I hate the neighbor who won't keep his dog quiet. But to be the good Samaritan that we're called to be, you have to go across the street to somebody who's not like you and say, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to spend my time, my energy to get to know you personally and to put up with all of your barking and then hopefully, hopefully, the relationship will develop to a place where they'll keep their dog quiet. But not, that's not the reason you're going. The reason you're going is because God is calling you to love them, the people that you hate. How do we do that? We do that by internalizing a biblical lifestyle. In order to have a biblical lifestyle, 
You have to know what the Bible is telling you. You have to know what God is revealing to humanity about himself. It's dating him. It's filling ourselves with the ability to be this sponge, dried out sponge, put into water, baptismal water, to soak up the divinity of God. So much so that when we are so full of God's divinity and we're sharing in the divinity of Christ, and the, water, the sponge is taken out of the water, it becomes wet, and then we can get other people wet with grace. That living water of our baptism is the grace that we want to share with everybody else. So we have to become a receptor of grace. We then become a dispenser of grace as we give that grace to everyone else. So what, what's grace? Grace is an unmerited, you don't deserve this, unwarranted, undeserved. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. Gift. God just decided to do it because he loves you. Same way a husband and a wife work together to build a family. You do it. You do all of the things. You put cover back on the toothpaste in the morning, not because it, you're required to, but it's because you love your wife. The rules we do are out of love. They're not out of obedience. Obedience is good. Don't get me wrong. We are obliged to come to Mass on Sunday. But if the only reason you're coming to Mass on Sunday is because it's the rule, you're not here for the right reason. You still should be here, yes. You're obliged to come on Sunday. But you want to come because you love God and you want to connect with Him. That's the reason you come to Mass. Out of desire. So, I'll give you an example. I'm a remodeling contractor, and about 25 years ago, um, before there were cell phones, okay, before there were cell phones, that's how long ago this was, I went out on a, a job, and my wife and I, I had told my wife I'll be home probably about 8 o'clock. Well, because the appointment was at 6, but the, the husband got called into work late, so he didn't get there till 9. So at nine o'clock, I I'm, I'm show up at the appointment and we're just going through all the various things and he, they wanted a room addition. So I'm designing out the room addition and then they're answering all the questions and then I had it all on my computer and we mapped it all out and I showed them what we were doing to do and they really liked it and so we're writing up the contract and, and then I looked at my watch and it's 2 a.m. I go, oh my God, I gotta call my wife. Pick up the phone, call my wife. She is in tears. She's called every hospital, all the police departments, looking for me because, what did I say? I'll be home at eight. And I'm a man of my word. And I forgot to call my wife. So she says, we made a rule that night that if I'm not going to be home when I say, I'm going to call her and tell her so that she knows where I am. That's the rule. Now, do I obey the rule out of obedience? No. I obey the rule 
because I love my wife and I don't want my wife to worry about me. Grace is a gift from God. He gives us these rules. He's established norms for us to do, rubrics for the mass, how we're supposed to relate to one another, concepts that we need, the concept of the Good Samaritan, the concept of a reconciliation ambassador, the concept of a loving father, the concept of a forgiving, repentant prodigal son. These concepts that we have to internalize because it's grace, it's a supernatural assistance to get it out of here and into here so that it gets out there. Because when you internalize grace, when people walk in front of you, they get wet with God's grace. And isn't that what we always say? Oh, I've got to give him grace. Love them and you love them. But we've all done to those things that we've internalized. Jesus every week. So that all of the various these things be the real presence of your consistency in you. Put your canine and chose you. That God has put there. Why do you all those like, like moment of your conception covering it? Gotta obey it because that's you hear that voice, don't you? It's not in your mind, is it? It's in your heart. Oh, you know, I shouldn't do this. You're about ready to steal a piece of gum. And no. Uh, you're walking through the store and the person in front of you is just absolutely crazy in line and you hate to stand in line and you want to speak out and you no, I'm just going to be patient. Patience is a virtue, best exercised now. You obey your conscience. That same voice that tells you what not to do is the voice that tells you what to do. It's voice ever calling us to love, to fall in love with God like we fall in love with our spouse, to love every neighbor as ourself, and to fall in love with ourself. To find out why it is that we were created the way that we are and to love the way that God created you. That's the first part of your conscience. Second one, to do what is good. From the moment of the creation of the world, God planned you. He knew you were going to be born at this moment in history because God has no time. He sees everything all at once. Everything. He knows everything you're ever going to do. And he's prepared things for you to do, but you have a choice to do them or not. He commands you to do them, but if you don't do them, you have to ask forgiveness. But each one of us are called to do things. Father Daryl and I are called to do things, so we can't do all the stuff that you're called to do. But as we learn to do and obey the things that we're asked to do and commanded to do by God, then the culture changes. When we reject the things that we're called to do, the lifestyle that we're called to live, then culture falls apart. When Catholicism becomes the dominant philosophical force, 
not just religious force, when Catholicism becomes the dominant philosophical force in the culture, the culture changes. When Catholicism rejects becoming the dominant force, the culture falls apart. If Catholicism is the truth, because we are the full representative of Christ, then every Catholic has to do the good deeds prepared for us to do in advance, because we're not Protestants. We, don't, we aren't just hearers of the word, we are doers of the word. You see our faith by what we do, not just by what we say. And then the third part of our conscience is to avoid evil. His conscience is man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God whose voice echoes in his depths. God is always speaking to us, but it's that still, small voice quietly whispering into our hearts, I'd like you to do this today. When you learn to listen to that voice, and then when you agree to start teaching others how to listen to that voice, then the culture is going to change. But we have to learn how to listen to that voice. God reveals himself to us to love us, to call us to love him. He invites us to reveal ourselves fully to him so that we can become like him. We are called to be Christ-like, like Jesus. But you notice that we don't say we're called to be Jesus-like. We say that we're called to be Christ-like. Christ means anointed one. So you're called to be Christian, little anointed ones, so that you are fulfilling your true identity to be Christ representative in the culture. Nikki, come forth. Oh, Nikki! I told you I changed it. Okay. So <laughs> okay, so we're going to hand out a prayer card for you. When the disciples wanted to learn how to internalize Jesus' teaching, the master would teach them a prayer is a prayer form. Being able to in into how to pray this stuff, who don't become discerned. Proclaim the gospel of, please go proclaim the gospel of the Lord, people that you meet. He didn't say he did pray. Yourself in full of the Spirit. You St. Patrick. Communion of saints. Because remember, altar, you could whatever it is you pray into a fans. They all their style that will bring you into the present all the time. Because he's revealed yeah, a life with it, even in the midst, even burnt at the stake, one of the your spiritual beings who he raised from the dead, the poor guy had to die twice. It's hard enough to go through it the first time. He had to do it twice. Okay? God will heal you spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. Yahweh Yuri, He provides everything you need and even some of the things you want. 
Yahweh Nisi. He's the covering over you. His banner over you is love. He wants to so enfold you in his love that everything that you think about and do is out of love for him and love for everyone else, for it's part of your conscience. Yahweh Rohi, he's your shepherd. He's the one who is going to guide you in all your steps. Lean into him, follow him, and as you learn more about him, as he reveals himself to you experientially, he's going to give you the grace to hand it on to your grandkids. Your kids aren't going to listen to you, okay? But your grandkids will, and your grandchildren will then evangelize your kids. Because when your grandkids fall in love with you, your kids will fall in love with you too, again. You then pray into existence the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole thing because we really don't have time. This is a two-hour, an hour to two-hour teaching that I'll give to you in some time. It'll actually be on my website probably within the next six months because I'll actually record this whole thing. But turn it over onto the back. This is, how Je this is what Jesus said when he was meditating on the scriptures. Remember, the New Testament isn't written yet. He hasn't lived the Gospels. He's not dead yet. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all that stuff is not even there yet. So when Jesus is meditating on the scriptures and he says, what does God tell us to do? It's the Psalms, the Proverbs, and the prophets. That's what he's talking about. Now remember that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. Meditate on the Psalms. So look on the left side of that where it says the day. Typically there's 30 days in a month. Sometimes you get 31, sometimes you get 28. But most of them are 30. Okay? So you intentionally decide to put a system into place that you're going to read five Psalms and one proverb a day. Okay, so you read Psalm 1, then 31, then 61, then 91, then 121, then Proverb 1. So today's the fourth. So on the fourth day of the month, you're going to read Psalm 4, 34, 64, 94, 124, not 123, you bush. There's another mistake on this silly thing. In 124 and 4. Okay? Now, but you read Scripture divinely. You say, well, how do I read Scripture divinely? All right? Scripture is intended for you to hear God speaking into that voice within your conscience. So the monks have taught us, especially the Benedictines, the monks have taught us how to read Scripture in a way that speaks to that inner, inner voice. So you're reading Psalm 1, and you get part of the way through it, and one of the verses just jump off the page. Stop. You've ended your prayer time because God the Father has just spoken to you through his word, God the Son, and now the Spirit has to take over because the Spirit within your spirit is uniting with you and he wants to teach you something because the reason that that highlighted is because he wants you to meditate on it. There's something there. You have discovered a gold nugget that you've got to clean off all of the debris around it to find out why 
God is speaking and highlighting that particular part of Scripture for you today. So it's like eating an apple. So you, the first thing you do when you, you get an apple is you wash it off, don't you? You wash it off. You soak it in your baptismal waters. So what you're doing is you're putting yourself into your anointing. God, speak to me as your child. You're a What does the word fearfully mean? You made me. Because we meditate and tomorrow. Talk about cells. Eh? You're fearful. How to asks you to take out the garbage, right? Big lines in. The day before I die to your heart. Write down, okay? Do I need to go to confession? Do I feel this way that's not true? His experience, a marriage, where be? In a little bit of our son or two, what? And then the other one gives up a little, the other one gives up a lot. And the other one gives up a little, and then eventually they lose themselves totally into the spouse. Most of the time, it's the man who's giving up the little, and it's the wife who's giving up a lot. That's not a Christian marriage. We have to die to ourselves, but we don't die to ourselves for our spouses. We die to ourselves for Christ. Okay? You take up your cross, you become like him. So you put Jesus higher. And you become, both of you, become closer and closer and closer to God, giving up your material attachments for that spiritual identity that is your true identity. And the closer you get to Christ, the closer you get to one another. And eventually, you'll get to a place where you, Jesus, and your spouse are one and the same. There is a spiritual marriage that occurs where then that marriage becomes truly sacramental, filled with grace. So much so that when the couple walks into the room, everybody says, my God, I wish I could be like that couple. Then you become an example to the culture. But after you respond to the Lord, then you go into rest. You think about it. You ponder it all day long. Just let it sit there. Let God then do you purpose to become what he's telling you to do, but let him Take over the work to change you. You're building the outside shell, but he's filling it with grace. You stay the earthen vessel. You point yourself in the direction. You go to confession. You come to the Eucharist. You offer that up. When, you're, when he's bringing the Eucharist up, you're offering that up to him. And he says, yes, this is what I want to do. Now, the next couple slides go through all of this stuff and how and explains it even more. But this type of internalization of our prayer life is a process, not a project. The project is the family. Remember that marriage is the first sacrament. We are restoring the family to its original design. The process is each person within the family, husband, wife, falling in love with God, helping each other fall in love with God and get rid of all the junk, and then becoming who God intended them to be and helping each other become that way and forgiving each other all the way in the process. And in the reality, we're then going to become the example to the culture that the Catholic Church is supposed to be. Now, the Holy Family 
fills us with an ability to do that. St. Joseph is here praying for you, but Mother Mary is the one who intercedes for you at the right hand with Jesus, Queen of Heaven. And the rosary gives you all the stories of God's life. All the stories of Jesus' life, all the way through. And it's important that you know the stories. The Psalms and the Proverbs tell you the Old Testament how to internalize all these emotions to bring you into the reality. But it's the life of Jesus. It's the life of Jesus that's going to be the one that you want to imitate. Okay? All the various things. That's why you pray the rosary. So I'm suggesting for a year that you take a decade of the rosary and pray that decade over the whole week. So the first week of the month, you just do the joyful mysteries. Just do one, but you pray five days. That, and especially the kingdom, is not just an infection. And again, this, I'm going to pray, heavenly to me, with the love that you share, when you anoint it, leading Jesus' kingship. Now, if you want it, don't take it if you don't wear suit coats anymore, but to remind you, created films that we've created as he's been in 2012, was selected by John Paul II. So we've given a you, we've made a film, I, I filmed it in England during COVID, um, and it's the Gospel of Mark. Most of us have never actually heard the Gospel of Mark all the way through. We get bits and pieces of it. Mark's is this, the shortest Gospel, and a friend of mine introduced me to an actor who had memorized the Gospel of Mark. So he has it word for word. So rather than it being a story, he dramatizes the Gospel of Mark. And he doesn't read it, he acts it out. So you hear it, see it, and experience it all at the same time. Really incredibly moving way of receiving the entire gospel in two and a half hours. Okay? Then, two friends of mine, Matt Lockett and Will Ford, Matt Lockett um, had a sense one day that he was supposed to go to the, Link, the Lincoln Memorial on the 41st anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. So he does, he doesn't know why, he goes there. And he meets this other guy, there's only about 50 people there, you know, but he flies from Denver to go there. And he meets this other guy named Will Ford. And in the process of them getting to know each other, they liked each other. They had coffee and then they started hanging out and then their wives liked each other, and then their kids liked each other, so they started going on vacations together. And 10 years later, the Holy Spirit dropped the bomb. Matt Lockett's ancestors owned Will Ford's ancestors, and the Civil War ended on the Lockett family farm in Virginia. Now, racism and slavery have a face in a name of somebody that I love. So it put them through three years of crisis on how to deal with these issues just before all the racial unrest in the United States. How do you like that? And so we got together and we recorded a retreat, seven days to change, to discover our identity in Christ instead of in our race or the hurts that have been given to us. So this is called the trilogy, but we have a whole slew of other things. So in the back, if you want this, you'll have this brochure, you can pick one up, Nikki's gonna give them to you on the way out, okay? 
and then you can subscribe to this. You can buy them if you want to, but it costs you too much money to buy them. Okay, so what I'd rather you do is subscribe at $13 a month through adc.cmex.tv, tells you how to do it here. And then you get all of this stuff. You can stream it in and invite your people in to watch this stuff. You get formed through over 500 hours of listening to me talk and other guys like me talk. Okay? But it helps form you. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, my, the attention of my brothers and sisters today. We ask your blessing upon them. Give them your grace and your ability to internalize what you're speaking to them through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much. And if you want, I'll be hanging around up here for a little bit um, to answer questions, and then we'll, we'll expose the Eucharist again.